Hello, and welcome back to the Thomistic Institute podcast. I'm Father Gregory Pine, uh, and I'll be hosting this episode. I know that you're accustomed to hear philosophy and theology lectures, which just begin from the beginning and then go to the end. Here, we're having these uh, special episodes so as to follow up with a professor who has lectured for the Thomistic Institute. Uh, but in the interest of deepening that, that theme or, yeah, just asking more questions so that we can, yeah, profit from their wisdom, um, and at the very least, learn to ask better questions ourselves. So in this particular episode, we're following up with Dr. George Corbett. So Dr. Corbett, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, pleasure to be here. All right. Cheers. So um, many of our listeners will have listened to the lecture that you gave uh, at the intellectual retreat on the way of beauty and Mozart. Uh, but for those who haven't heard the lecture, for those who aren't familiar with you and your work, would you just say a word about you know, who you are, where you're from and what you're doing? Yes, of course. So I work in the School of Divinity at the University of St. Andrews. Um, we have an Institute for Theology, Imagination and the Arts. So I work there with masters and PhD students on theology and the arts, have particular interest in, in Dante, uh, but also in the relationship between theology and music and sacred music. And I also work uh, in historical and systematic theology with a particular interest on uh, Aquinas and also on Thomism and the, and the development of Catholic theology. Yeah, we were discussing before we push record about how working in Thomism can be difficult because one does not always have something original to say on account of the fact that people have been saying original things about St. Thomas Aquinas for 750 years. <laughs> but in this particular episode, not necessarily looking to say new things, but looking to say, you know, true good and beautiful things insofar as they... Um, yeah, and so far as they can be expressed. So um, this particular lecture, which I listened to and enjoyed very much, um, was, was treating the theme of beauty, and then you made application in the life and work of Mozart. So I thought, um, yeah, we'd just start with beauty, start with the way of beauty. Uh, and you began the lecture with a, a kind of quintessential description of beauty um, according to the, uh, the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. I think, um, you know, in my case, or perhaps in the case of many of our listeners, um, there's this question of like, why, why is beauty in vogue in the sense, like, why do people refer to beauty as having a kind of evidential power uh, or like, what is it about beauty that refers beyond itself? So maybe just to start on a kind of phenomenological note, you know, what is it about beauty that arrests us or what is it about beauty that, that captures our hearts? Um, Yes, well, first of all, um, I'm not too surprised that there's this, um, sometimes you find this scepticism about um, the reappraisal of beauty, particularly in the Catholic tradition of the 20th century, from Thomas. <laughs> um, uh, and that's why I was amused um, uh, by uh, Father Aidan Nichols, your confrere, you know, who having written all these books introducing the work of von Balthasar uh, wrote a couple of years ago a book von Balthasar for Thomas, <laughs> um, because sometimes you get this kind of dichotomy. You know, you're either a Thomas or you're Balthasarian. Um, but I think, I mean, one, we shouldn't just associate the recovery of beauty with uh, von Balthasar, um, uh, although his theological aesthetics has been particularly I influential. Um, but also, just because um, Aquinas doesn't make beauty um a kind of structuring principle of, of his work as does Balsa. it doesn't mean that uh, beauty isn't incredibly important for aquinas and um i think one of the beautiful things which is one of the beautiful things i'm using beauty in a lazy way i shouldn't do that <laughs> because it has a particular but anyway um um but one of the the lovely ways that people have come to think about something like the summa is to say look this itself has an extraordinary harmony, an order, a structure. Um, it's a bit like um, a, a wonderful Romanesque or Gothic cathedral. Everything fits in its place. Um, and also, when we were just talking before we, you pressed record also about the third part of the Summa and the, the treatise on the Incarnation on Christology. And there in particular, the Aquinas typically arcs, argues ex convenientia, all these arguments where he's really saying, you know, God is one. Um, the incarnation isn't necessary, but it's fitting to God. What we know about God, that God loves to communicate himself, that God is fully good and wants to communicate that goodness, um, that God created the world out of love. 
Well, the incarnation is the fullest expression of that, the fullest expression of his goodness. The fact that in the, the Summa, Aquinas, I think, gives seven positive arguments for the incarnation before he comes on to the St. Paul argument about the, the remedy of sin. Um, and I think um, some people have started saying, well, those arguments ex conveniencia are in a sense an appeal to beauty, to the order of God's salvific working in creation. So, um, yeah, so that's just a first thought, you know, that, that beauty in that sense is at the heart of Aquinas's work. And I think, you know, one of the reasons I was attracted to Aquinas again, I think, is first of all, that, that amazement at the beauty and the order of his thought. Um, and one of the classical or philosophical characteristics of beauty is that beauty is the disinterested one. Um, we take pleasure in something as being beautiful um, without wanting to possess it, um, uh, but just because of its own beauty. And I think there's something about Aquinas's thought as well, the sort of magisterial uh, order and harmony of thought that just strikes us as beauty. What does it then do? What does beauty do? What's the role of beauty? I think then beauty draws us in. You know, we see something which which draws us out of ourselves and we want to discover more. We want to be drawn in. This is fascinating um, in the sense that I see here a kind of avenue for, yeah, theological like argumentation or theological explanation as a kind of via pulchritudinis. So, all right, uh, phenomenological thought followed by more rigorous explanation followed by follow-up question. Um, <clears throat> so my thought is my best friend is a philosopher and often his approach to reality is like, you know, he, he, he wants to get to the very thing itself and he is hungry and thirsty until such time as he can, you know, sink his teeth into solid food or, you know, enjoy the refreshing, thirst-quenching delights of solid drink. And until such time, he's completely content to wander in the phenomenological desert. Like, he doesn't go in for arguments just because they sound nice, right? He, he, he wants the very thing itself. Whereas my instinct when I make theological arguments is I often get ahead of myself rhetorically, and I'm saying things, and I'm thinking about parallel structure and subordinated clauses, and how this Latinate word sounds against the backdrop of this more Anglo-Saxon word. And then every once in a while, I'm like, wow, I... I think that might actually be true. <laughs> and then I'm embarrassed that I permitted myself to like, you know, run away or have the argument run away with me. But I think that what you described, like there's a kind of beauty to the argument ex conveniencia that St. Thomas is, is sounding the depths of the divine wisdom. And when he sounds the depths of the divine wisdom, he's asking about its coherence. He's asking about its integrity. He's asking about its splendor, its clarity, all the things that you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture. And in light of that evidence, right, he comes to discover within something that's, that's true and that's good, which is fascinating. Uh, and I hadn't thought about it in those terms, and maybe I'm just using this as a massive self-justification. Um, but there, go ahead. It's, it's yours. <laughs> hey, cheers. I'm always, I'm always looking for those until such time as they are. Yeah. Until they are, they're smashed before my very eyes. Um, so yeah, like in, in light of these facts, when, you know, like we are trying to, to formulate arguments when we're trying to get to the heart of the reality, um, how, you know, is there, is there a kind of discipline whereby we, you know, cling to the thing or whereby we chasten or whereby we um, kind of like reprimand that tendency to get lost in an aestheticism or to find ourselves drifting in the direction of the merely sensibly satisfying or however you might describe it. So I'm thinking about it in those terms, but yeah, you have a jumping off point there for, uh, yeah, different, yeah. different, different avenues. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, fascinating and, and in a sense even the metaphors you're using for your friend you know he's a philosopher he likes to deal with reality he likes to be able to eat it he likes to be able to drink it he wants to you know get to grips with it um and, and i think that's in a sense revealing of a wider culture you know we live in quite a materialist um capitalist also culture where you want to possess things and and you want things to have an immediate um uh kind of purpose that you can touch and hold um and even if we think about the way that philosophy has gone and, and the way that certainly in uk universities it's narrowed um 
I think part of that reflects that broader culture. And um, what I mean by that is um, we're, we're not necessarily that comfortable with um, a more abstract contemplation. Um, and, and similarly in theology, you can have an answer, well, let's not do the dogmatics and this thing, because we need to deal with social issues. Of course, social issues are really important. But there's there's also this part of in the human psyche, obviously, of of, of the contemplative. Um, and um, I think beauty does have a role there. Um, but beauty does not mean falling into aestheticism necessarily, and nor does it mean becoming an aesthete. And I think that's where um, the recovery of beauty or the pre-modern understanding of beauty as always in relation to goodness and truth is so important. Um, uh, you know, Aquinas is to, to, to come back to Aquinas. You know, he doesn't make beauty the the primary structuring principle, but as I've just tentatively suggested, it it's there in his work, um, and not just. I mean, people could point to his liturgical poems and his uh, prayers where he he's kind of engaging what we would think of as as poetry, um, but also in the way that. Um, he writes his treatise, he gives thought to their order, to their harmony, to how everything fits together. Um, and we might say, well, wouldn't it be nice if um, some uh, philosophical textbook, some of which seem to write in a way as to be intentionally obscure um, <laughs> and to be difficult to understand, like you just said, um, and, and that was my encounter with first encounter with Aquinas in undergraduate. I, I was studying all sort of phenomenological um, ideas, lots of continental philosophy. And I, I just suddenly came to uh, Aquinas because I was studying classical philosophy. And I felt this is so clear. This makes sense. He goes from A to B to C. I can follow his argument. Clarity. Clarity, as you say, is one of the three key conditions of beauty. So always in Aquinas, we have a model for someone where beauty is there, but it's in relation to goodness and truth. What happens, obviously, after, I mean, famously, it gets sort of, uh, you know, Kant gets the blame uh, with his critique of judgment um, and kind of separating off the aesthetic from the good and the true, is you do get aestheticism, um, a, a kind of following of a, a kind of narrowed beauty, um, which is deliberately seen as an amoral sphere as something not connected to the good or the true um and and i think um you know in recovering beauty we have to be careful there not to sort of recover something as detached but rather as something connected to the good and the true and i do think that you know that's what von balthasar was saying he was saying that in the 20th century you had a danger of moralism where uh Catholicism was just a whole series of moral rules. And then you had a slight latent tendency within a certain kind of scholastic manualist tradition to present the truth as, as, as if it were just a series of things that you learnt, like a catechism. And what he says is we need to reintroduce beauty because the morality loses its taste, its flavour, its attractiveness without beauty. And similarly, truth loses its attraction without beauty. And, you know, I'm someone who loves Dante um, and Dante as a medievalist. How does he present the, the wise people? He presents them as philosoph philosophers, right? They're all lovers of wisdom in his beautiful account. I mean, it's Bonaventure who gives the account of St. Dominic, but he calls him this lover of faith and all the erotic language of the Song of Songs is there. Um I think that is a, a wonderful thing to recover today, that sense that the quest for truth um, is um, an erotic one. It's, um, it's about being in love. It's about being attracted. And similarly, the, the good life, the moral life, isn't some kind of Puritan moralistic or Victorian morals of just being good and doing what you ought to do. But instead, you can be in love with the good it's something attractive it's something which fulfills you um and um although we might not use the same gender uh gendered language as before um as i say you know this kind of allegorization of, of saint dominic in love with um lady faith or saint francis in love with lady poverty and again that's 
that's like in love with the good um uh saint dominic in love with the truth nonetheless we need to recover that idea um uh um i think um okay so as you're describing um yeah as you're describing the kind of erotic quality on the one hand or like these elements of the true and the good that are present within um it's yeah it's evident to me that in the way in which well let me let me discipline my language when we speak about beauty we often draw examples from a variety of things which are close to our experience and then depending on the setting and context we'll we'll apply them in different ways so it seems like there are aesthetic applications you know people will often talk about the visual arts there are moral applications sometimes people will talk about the beauty of a particular testimony or a particular witness the way in which this person lives his or her life makes me want to live mine in a way that's more coherent and then we'll talk about it in terms of religious i mean this isn't to limit it just to these three but like religious experience like yeah. the sublime is yeah. often categorized as a kind of numinous beauty so I guess my question is, to what extent do you think that like lower examples can illumine higher examples or higher examples can illumine lower examples? I guess in the background, I'm thinking of not the problem of, but the, the reality of analogy, that they're partly alike and partly diverse. And as a result of which, when we, you know, when we use beauty as a middle term, we need to be cognizant of the type of work that it's doing in the argument. So sometimes you'll hear people say like, Grand Canyon, therefore God exists. And you're like, wait a second. <laughs> Because if you're a scientist, an atheist scientist hearing that argument, you're like, no, like different density of rock, Colorado River, therefore the, can you know, like Grand Canyon exists. So, so you know, as, as, a, as an apologist or as a polemicist or as a philosopher or as one who's engaged in this type of work, at the very least thinking about these types of realities, what do you think is the, the, the translation, the work of translation that we need to do there? Yes. Um, yeah. So you kind of categorized a whole different series of um, sites where we might encounter beauty, um, Grand Canyon, the natural world, um, uh, maybe particular objects that are made which are beautiful. Maybe you know sometimes the human being itself can be uh, beautiful, um, and then these kind of moral the beauty of the saints. Um, and I think you know it's one of the beautiful. I mean, someone who's written a lot, influenced by von Balthasar, this is um, Joseph Ratzinger, um, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, and um you know he said both you know he's re really affirmed this pathway of beauty and written beautifully on it um and you know for him he sees say the music of the classical tradition and sort of preeminently of composers such as Bach as testimony of the truth of Christianity um and but he also says you know if people are going to be drawn to Christianity today um, they're going to be drawn by the lives of the saints, the beauty that they see in the lives of the saints, much more readily than by some kind of propositional argument. Um, and I suppose a great type against someone else who's very influential in the history of the church in the production of beauty might be uh, Ignatius of Loyola, who, who famously had a, ser a similar conversion uh, in Pamplona when um, he read the lives of the saints and he found in there a depth of beauty a, an excitement um, which um, created in him a desire to follow them and then of course he found that the Jesuits were very important also for the proliferation in the Catholic Reformation of art across um, Europe. Um, from a theological point of view, I mean, someone who often gets brought up in these conversations is the German Lutheran theologian Rudolf Otto. Um, and he talked about how there's um, a parallel, uh, particularly for your scientist, atheist or whatever, between um, the experiences that people say that they have in relation to um the beauty in art and also in nature and the experience of the holy. And so he suggests that um, because it has a similar kind of affective and spiritual um, uh, effect on, on the person, um, the one experience, say, of art can stimulate um, the experience of the holy. Or to put it another way, um, uh, an encounter with art can dispose or prepare someone to be open to uh, an encounter with faith or the holy. Um, and again, I think, you know, if we live in a very materialist culture, um, 
uh, where we seek an instant gratification, including through culture, we can see how that has an effect on spirituality. Whereas if we think about some of the great arts, which require a lot of study, contemplation, a silence of the heart, a space, we can see how the experience of art can provide um, a kind of cultivation, if you like, of the human person to be more open to um, the holy. Um, personally, I prefer um, the work of, I mean, he's been very involved with visual art of Richard Villadesau, um, where he's more comfortable with reclaiming the analogy of being. So for him, um, say, uh, a religious experience of, oh, sorry, an experience of music, say, isn't merely an emotional analogy of a sacred um, experience, but actually music itself or the natural world or visual art can give a direct experience of um, the sacred. In other words, when we are perceiving um, beauty, because God is beauty, we are having our participated experience um, in in God. Um, uh, I mean, again, they. I think you have to distinguish the, the sort of philosophical language of analogy of being um, from the theological language. And again, something I really love that Villa Dessau talks about is how, you know, with art, we're invited into an imaginative empathy with the artist or with the character. In other words, you know, if we're listening to Bach's passion, we're invited to, even if we're not religious, to enter into the religious faith of Bach in order to really get a sense of what's going on, to appreciate it. Um, and in doing that, even if we're just doing it imaginatively, um, we start getting a sense of, well, how does that feel? Does, is that natural to me to be in that Christian religious experience or does it feel unnatural? And what Villadesa says is for some people then in doing that, in, in that kind of imaginal empathy that you have through art, you start realizing actually what seemed alien actually is very human and natural, that Christ is the true man in that sense. And I think we also get that in the other arts in literature. You know, in literature, you're invited to enter into all sorts of different perspectives to a materialist atheist position. I mean, I've worked a lot on Epicurus and the history of Epicurean philosophy, essentially the history of atheism. Um, and, you know, I love I love Lucretius de Natur. I love entering into his worldview. And um, uh, but I've also entered into other worldviews. And, and in doing that, Again, it's a way in which the arts help us to broaden our minds, open us also to uh, different perspectives, including faith perspectives, and break out from sometimes a very materialist and narrow worldview, which I think a number of people are trapped in today. And um, as, as culture becomes ever more polarised and the internet makes people uh, sort of see self-affirming views. Uh, people are just like getting more and more closed into these prisms. So we need art to enable people to enter into other people's views um, and, and break out of the sort of prisms that they're, they're finding themselves in. Um, <clears throat> so in the middle of your lecture, so apropos of these thoughts, in the middle of your lecture, you describe the beauty of Christ as a kind of transition point between a philosophical description of beauty and then the, the sublimity of the musical experience, which you described in the latter half of the lecture. And when thinking about that, I'm thinking about my own research, um, and I'm thinking about how, you know, in the Thomistic tradition, two words applied to the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ are instrument and sign. So St. Thomas takes this instrument language from, the, I mean, the largely Greek tradition, but it's also picked up in the in the Latin tradition, um, so you find in like Athanasius and Cyril and John Damascene and Maximus the Confessor and others of such like, uh, this reference to the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ as the organon, uh, you know, as like the instrument, as it were, associated with the divinity. Obviously, it's a it's a pretty close association um, in the work of salvation. Uh, but then you also see, you know, certain authors begin, rather than beginning with the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, they begin with the experience of the sacraments, and they fashion your theory on that basis. And while the sacraments are aptly described as kind of, sec you know, secondary or separated instruments, uh, they're more often referred to under the rubric of sign. So you have these, uh, you have a kind of polarity in the way that some authors will talk about our Lord's sacred humanity as kind of referring beyond itself, and then as something which is taken up in like sublimely and intimately 
to the Godhead without changing the Godhead, but in, in the work of salvation. So you have, on the one hand, like something that makes reference without, something that gestures beyond, and on the other hand, something that's like, yeah, the images that St. Thomas uses to describe instrumentality are like wielding an axe or like having a hand fused onto an otherwise one-handed body and things like that. So they're very, ugh. Um, so when I think about this in terms of, right, so what we've just described with respect to beauty and then, you know, kind of kind of looking forward to the experience that one has in the arts and beyond of beauty, um, you know, like what kind of what kind of resources do we have in the Christian tradition which give us maybe... Yeah, a particular approach, a peculiar approach, you know, thinking about it in terms of, you know, signs and sacraments, in terms of, you know, instruments and the very flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've, yeah, oftentimes when I pose questions, it's just like, here are a bunch of nouns, here are a bunch of verbs, here are a bunch of direct objects. What are your thoughts? So that wasn't very well formulated or well fashioned. Um, but, but in terms of, yeah, some of the things that I've just mentioned, where does that, um, where does that lead the discourse? Yes, well, I think one way of looking at that is saying, he is Aquinas in the third part, um, giving a dogmatic treatise, at least the beginning as we're talking, on Christology. And he's using um, some technical philosophical language in order to, to do that. Um, but what's happening around him? How is that doctrine being translated? And I think... Um, that's where we, if we look at the, the world in which Aquinas is living, we're seeing this explosion of church building. You know, his order, the Dominicans, are building these incredible uh, buildings, explosion of music, an explosion of visual art. I mean, you always think within the Dominicans of Beato Angelico. I mean, that's 100 years afterwards. And I would see that as the translation of that language. Because like you say, when you're talking about instrumentality and you know, it's like the axe, you think, well, no, that, that's not a very good metaphor. It might be helpful to understand the technical uh, way in which um, instrumental causality is working, but it's a strange way to relate affectively to Christ. Um, so um, I would say, look, you know, what does Aquinas say? There's two great mysteries of the Christian faith, the divinity of the uh, Holy Trinity and the humanity of Christ. And the humanity of Christ is the pathway to the divinity of Christ. The, the humanity of Christ is how we come to the divinity of Christ. And the humanity of Christ, you just understand it, you know, that, under, that is the flesh, as you're talking about. Um, but it's also um, translated into, of course, um, the church and the sacraments and also into the church's art. And I suppose here we're moving then, if, if Christ is the source then, to art, which we might, one way of defining sacred art is, art which is explicitly uh, orientated to uh, uh, communicating the Christian mysteries. Um, and I mean, I alluded in, in my talk to the Via Pulcutudinis, but also to some other letters from John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, um, inviting artists, including atheists and secular artists, but especially Christian artists, to take up that exalted vocation to communicate um, through beauty, the mysteries of the Christian faith. Um, and uh, in, in my own experience, um, I know that I came to uh, faith or um, through that pathway of beauty. Um, I know that I was drawn. I mean, I had the fortune, you know, as a child, I was a chorister at St. Albans Abbey. Um, so there you had this 11th century Benedictine Abbey. I mean, it's restored in different things. So you, you're drawn to, to just the, the, the size, the awe, um, the, the structure, the permanence, if you like, of it. This is a building which had lasted a thousand years. You know, how many buildings put up in the last 50 years will last a thousand years? Um, uh, I was drawn to the music um, of the Christian faith. I was drawn to the art. I mean, I mentioned Beato Angelico. Um, and um, a lot of people um, kind of, or some people can stop that. I lived for a year in Pisa, where you have the famous Piazza dei Tre Miracoli. And there's a huge car park just outside Pisa where a busload of tourists come in and they go to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and they take their picture and they go. And, and I always found that rather tragic because, I mean, the Campanile, the tower is beautiful, but you've got the Duomo, you've got this extraordinary baptistry by Dio Salvi, 
um, which also has this incredible, um, it's built with this acoustic properties uh, with, with basically between the ceiling, there's a false ceiling. And it um, when you sing a note, it resonates all the harmonies, the harmonic series. Um, for me, that beauty is an invitation uh, because those buildings were created, that art was created to communicate the beauty of Christ, the beauty of the Christian faith. And so I think I think that's what um, uh, for me, um, you know, where, where does art and beauty have a, a particular role um, Christologically? Uh, well, we see in the history of, of Western art that um, uh, art um, can be transformed in very profound ways through the encounter with the Christian faith. Um, and, and indeed, some of the great it's no it's no accident that some of the greatest art that we have was um, came into being in uh, at the culture of Christianity. Um, and I mean, we can then get on to questions of idolatry and, um, you know, the misuse of art um, and is art being used as an icon or is it or are you falling into aestheticism? Um, but um Again, if you think exactly the time of, of Aquinas, you've got Cimabue, Giotto, you've got those incredible crucifixes, you've got the move to the um, Christus Patiens, the suffering Christ. Um, and you've got this sense that on meditating on the humanity of Christ, and obviously it helps to have an image of Christ, a physical image, um, on meditating on the humanity of Christ, and St. Francis, of course, did this as well, um, that is a pathway to come to the divinity of Christ, um, but it's not just intellectual; it's it's also affective, and and the arts have a really important role in um, in drawing in the senses um, to that devotion. I think. So, maybe just to follow up with that, um, and then thinking in conversation with uh, the end of the lecture, wherein you describe you described how um, Mozart, you know, being inspired by not merely a Christian worldview, but a very like dense, thick, like Christian vision, which was at work in his family. Um, I'm thinking of like the next generation of Christian artists, of Catholic artists. So I think that maybe in the last, I don't, I don't have any, uh, you know, genuine evidence on which to base these things, but rarely, rarely do I render evidence for my wild, yeah, opining. Um, so it seems to me like there's been this work of kind of reconnecting with the tradition. And that's true, like in the church more broadly, but in, in the in sacred art, you see a lot of people saying, you know, what was once was good. And what's kind of downstream of modernism or postmodernism or hypermodernism, when you think about it in terms of like architecture, especially, is not so good. So we need to reestablish a kind of connection with that tradition, which is great. Um, but at certain moments, sometimes that devolves into a kind of preferential option for the ancient. If it's old, it's good. You know, uh, if we want something good, we just need to buy it from a warehouse where it's been left, you know, for the past hundred years. Okay. So I think that there's been, there's been a necessary work of recovery, but it seems like now we're, we're poised for a, a new kind of renaissance. It seems like a lot of, a lot of, yeah, ecclesial life has reestablished that connection, that there is something of a vibrant tradition, which has been reanimated in the life of the church. And so now we're, yeah, we're poised for, for a new Mozart or for a new Dante or for a whatever it might be. Maybe that's a little bit too optimistic, but I've never been, like, I've never been, what would you say? I've never been told that I'm optimistic, so I'll just let it ride. Um, so when you think about this, this generation of Catholic artists, what are the habits of mind and heart uh, you know, with which they should endeavor this work of creation or, or con-creation? Um, what are the ways in which or what are the opportunities through which you see, yeah, like new artistic ventures or, uh, yeah, new artistic possibilities that, that await us in the 21st century? So, I mean, first of all, I share your optimism um, in that, you know, when people say you couldn't have an Aquinas or a Dante today or everything's in the past you know i mean i've got four children and you know i'm not that they're going to be um great answers but you know you, you always have to remember that they were once a baby and they were born in ignorance and sin you know, including aquinas and dante they knew nothing and they came forth from the hand of the creator knowing nothing but so there is a sense that you know hu human beings over the last you know uh five thousand years haven't changed very much you know we haven't evolved um and become a different species or anything like that. So there's no reason in terms of our natural potency, if you like, that we can't um, aspire to 
the greatest art. Um, I would have a little bit more of a sceptical view of there being a, a contemporary Dante um, or indeed a contemporary Aquinas, um, because as well as having that natural potency, you have to have um, a culture, a live culture into which these people can grow. Um, and, um, you know, Aquinas, you know, as, as a toddler was sent to, Subi uh, was it no, not Subiaca, to Monte Cassino, you know, and, 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 and was sort of studying the liberal arts. So it's incredibly young and um, trained. And similarly, um, um, you know, Dante came into a culture which was incredibly um, intellectual, artistic, um, you know, and, 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 and therefore he was able to develop within that. Um, I, I'm not convinced that we have those structures of um, craft um, either in the arts or intellectually in, in quite the same way today. Um, but as I said, it's, it's not possible not to um, to reconstitute them. And I, and I just share your sense that, you know, there is a turn. I mean, even in the turn that we've seen, you know, that I just love the Thomistic Institute, um, uh, you know, t back towards Thomism. Well, that is a, a turn. It is a turn back in a sense, because it's to a tradition of thought, which has evolved over time, very creatively from the thought of Aquinas. Um, but it's also a sense that if we want to grow and really do great things, we have to stand on the shoulders of giants. We can't just jump off. Um, and I think there has been a tendency, even if we look in, in Catholic thought um, over the last 50 years, to just jump off the shoulders and then think that you're doing new things and going forward. And I think we see the same thing. If you think about the history of classical music, there was a very deliberate rejection of the classical music tradition that says that in order to do new things, we need to reject what's gone before. We still preserve it as a kind of museum culture, but we're rejecting tonality. We're rejecting certain um, forms of art. It's not um, a, a sense of a development of a tradition. And so, you know, my own view is that if you want to have really great art, art um, and the great artist is someone who is able to enter into that tradition. Again, someone like Dante, you, you, you know, Dante studied classical poetry. Uh, he, he, his maestro in poetry was Virgil. He, he, he probably knew the whole Aeneid by heart. He studied classical poetics. He knew stasis. He knew of it. He was a scholar. He also studied very deeply philosophy. He studied theology. He studied the arts. In doing that, he became incredibly skilled also as a poet, as a thinker, uh, and was able to, 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 to write the extraordinary poetry that he did before. Um, and again, I would say, you know, Aquinas is, before being the exemplary teacher, he's the exemplary student. And of course, that's what's so beautiful about the, you know, the famous anecdote with Albert of Great, that Aquinas didn't say anything. You know, the greatest student was silent. Um, for all that time, because he was showing us the humility of the student, um, even though he probably knew much more than his teachers then, he was silent. But then, of course, um, you know, St. Albert said, well, he will, you know, bellow forth uh, more than anyone else or whatever. So so I think um, I think the call for artists, if, if they want to become truly great, if they want their art to last a thousand years, um, in my view, is they need to really uh, rediscover the, the craft. And then to create new things, not just to be like a gothic revival, where you're just copying something from the past, to create new things. But uh, w with that profound craft, um, there you go. That's, but that's just my, again, opining. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm just following your lead, you know, without substantiation, without any evidence. You know, that's I'm just it. mirroring you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I seek to create safe spaces by my relative lack of competence. Therefore, all shine by comparison. <laughs> no, well, no, on the contrary. No, but anyway, there you go. Just be very free. Yeah. Thank. Well, thank you so much, and thanks so much for yeah for the follow up for for answering these questions for yeah helping to refine some of these insights. It's been very helpful for me, and it'll be very helpful for our for our listeners. Um, if you wouldn't mind, just would you direct our listeners to some of your work, maybe uh, some of the institutes that you mentioned at the beginning or uh, some of the places where they could find your academic contributions? 
Yes, um, please come to the, the School of Divinity, the University of St. Andrews. Uh, we have a wonderful master's program in um, Theology and the Arts, the Institute for Theology, Imagination and the Arts, and a new master's program in Sacred Music. Um, you can also come and study Aquinas and Historical Systematic um, Theology. In terms of my recent books, um, Dante's Christian Ethics, Purgatory in its Moral Context, was published by CUP in, in 2020. I also wrote a book on Dante and Epicurus, um, some volumes on uh, vertical readings in Dante's comedy, and a big book, Annunciation, Sacred Music for the 21st Century. Um, so, yeah, and I have a profile on the School of Divinity, University Century, St Andrew's website, so please feel free to get in touch if you're interested in uh, master's or PhD work here. Excellent. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. And, um, uh, thanks to the listener. Uh, if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast, wherever you listen to your podcasts and then check out Thomistic uh, for further programs and in-person events and yeah, other good things, which please God will help us to recover the tradition and thereby to become, you know, artists or contributors in our own right, even if it be modest and simple in many of our cases. All right, so that's all we have for uh, this episode, and we will look forward to chatting with you next time on the next. Cheers. Cheers.